You're listening to After No War, broadcasting from the beautiful South Birmingham. Except no sandwich. Hello, dear listeners. Now, I don't know about you, but I've got an earworm going through my head. It's called Nathan Jones. You've been gone too long. And I can't get it out of my head. Joining me to talk about Nathan Jones <laughs> and all of the other contenders that are um, apparently in the air for the Millwall uh, job at the moment, Millwall managerial job, is is my uh, co-host and colleague. It's Mr. Neil Fissler. How are you, Neil? Uh, not too bad. Not too bad. I'm, uh, I'm not sure that we'll uh, talk about Banana Rama. Or Supremes. That was a debate I got involved in. Is it this the Supremes? Or the Banana Rama version, um, and I don't really. I thought at that point I've got to get out of this debate because um, yeah, well, I look upon it as a Banana Rama song. To be honest, <laughs> it's a <supreme> song. <laughs> song. <laughs> it's a classic. And, uh, <laughs> yeah. Once it gets in your head, listeners, it, it won't get out of your head, and I'm stuck with it at the moment, even as I'm talking to Neil. Um, but before we just. Uh, do our show today. We're going to have a little look at some of the runners and riders uh, and the speculation because that's all we've got really to talk about for the, uh, the managerial search at, at the den. But we've got our pundit question, Neil. Um, as listeners will know, Millwall, uh, the Acton Mill and Pundit Games are teamed up this season. Every sale of this fantastic board game generates a, a donation to the Lions Food Hub. Fantastic balls. Um, visit punditgames.co.uk. It's a wonderful board game. You answer a series of football-related questions, such as the one I'm going to tease you with shortly. Um, and if you answer five in a row, you score a goal against your opponent and you play for 45 minutes each or whatever period of time they choose. Uh, highest scorer wins, obviously, just like football. So I'm going to tease you now, Neil. You sh- I don't think you're going to get this one, mate. I've, I've selected one to suit the more mature listener out there. Oh. Um, this is this is a World Cup question, Neil. This is uh, one of Germany's West Germany Germany's best ever players. This forward played in the same four World Cups as Pele, and the photo of him leaving the field after losing the nineteen sixty six World Cup final to England was voted photo of the century by Kicker magazine. Um, played four hundred and seventy six times for Hamburg, scoring four hundred and four goals from nineteen fifty three to seventy two. Bizarrely played one game for Cork Celtic in 1978, scored two goals um, at that point, and played for West Germany 72 times, scoring 43 goals, 1954 to 1970. Very famous name. Got any ideas, Neil? Uh, originally, I was thinking Gert Muller, but I'm not mm. sure if he played for, for them or Bayern Munich. To be honest, but no, uh, that would that would have been my guess. If that's wrong, then it's a wrong guess. But we'll come back to the answer at the end of the show, listeners, because that way you have to listen to the whole show to get the answer. <laughs> we extort listeners on this on this particular podcast. Um, so yeah, we'll do the answer at the end of today's conversation with Neil. Um, Neil, you and I have been talking about the manager. It does seem to be dragging on this this process, doesn't it? We do seem to make a big. Um, you know, an exhaustive search. I think the, the uh, South London Press, Richard Corley, are uh, reporting an exhaustive search. Uh, it's a big contrast with QPR. We've appointed a Spanish manager, Cifuentes, I think his name is, quite quickly. We, we do tend to take our time. 18 days to appoint Gary Rowett in 2019. And it's now 13 days since Rowett left us. I don't know why we drag, drag on so, do you? I think you'll find, isn't it? Probably 15 now, because that story would have been written a couple of days yeah. ago. Yeah, yeah, so 15, yeah, 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 right, yeah. So, I'll be honest, I just want the speculation to end. Yeah. I don't think I can get on with it. I think they're probably down to, they're probably sorted out the week from the chaff last week. I think they interviewed. Ten Rick, candidates, ten, 10 candidates, yeah. Ten candidates, which is probably... And unless you do a QPR where I think they'd probably decided who they wanted yeah. before they got rid of Ainsworth. Uh, I think, yeah, but if you look at it, if we've interviewed 10 people, we haven't got somebody lined up, it would all spank to me that we didn't see it coming. No, I agree. I agree. Um 
you will know what you were speculating the last time I was on, which was a couple of weeks ago. Now, Christ, it seems like a long time, doesn't it? It does the, seem a long time. But, yeah, no, and also the, the kind of relative warmth of the words between the club and Gary Rowe, it implied a kind of a... Oh, what's the word? The, the mutual mutual understanding. I can't remember the mutual but mutual agreement. So it was like it. They everyone was very happy with it. But I, I I do agree. It does seem like we we weren't prepared for it at all, which um, is interesting. Um, ten candidates. The uh, South London reports. Richard Corley. Um, the this SLP understands that John Eustace is not in the running. I think he seems to be a name also with Rowett for the Bristol City job now, um, which is vacant at the moment. Um, they do report that Nathan Jones, hence my heavy-handed gag at the start of today's show, uh, is under consideration. Um, just looking at the Sky bets, you get various um, betting odds on uh, betting Victor, Bet Victor, and, and Sky Bet. But Nathan Jones is favourite on both of those two websites. Five to four with Sky Bets and even money with uh, Bet Victor. Um, followed by now a new name. One I hadn't heard of, but an interesting name, which is this uh, Joe Edwards, who's come out of nowhere slightly. Um, but Nathan Jones seems to be his favourite, and I would imagine his experience and relative success with Luton, anyway, um, would make him the, the probably the, the most obvious candidate of, of the grouping. I'd be very disappointed if Rowett does go to Bristol City. I don't think he is. I think they're going to go down the Eustace route. Mm. Is everything because he wanted to move nearer to home. Yeah, I'm not sure if Bristol's nearer to. It's probably an easier drive, just but not much in it, really, is there? Well, considering that I was told yesterday, I spoke to a friend of mine down here yesterday, and uh, and Nigel Pearson, who's just left a Bristol City job, lives three miles from where I live. Right. Okay. Okay. Believe it or not, he lives in deepest, darkest Devon. Right, so he drives up to Bristol. That's a fair old drive every day, isn't it? I mean, it's it's far enough. It I was very surprised when he told me where he lived. Yeah. Uh, I was very, very surprised. It's, it's literally, it's the next village over. Okay. From where <laughs> and uh, so I'd be disappointed if Rowett wasn't honest. And I've got no reason to suggest that he has been. But if he was to to suddenly pop up at Bristol City, uh, yeah, it'd leave it, a sour taste, wouldn't it? I mean, it would, yeah, it would... It would, it would leave it because yeah, well, I know there are people that aren't bothered that that he was with us and they wanted him gone, etc., etc., etc. But that would spank to me that there's a bit of preemptiveness in it. Yeah. Like the the that it was orchestrated, I don't know, but I think we're down to the last two. I wouldn't, I wouldn't be against Nathan Jones to be honest. No, no. He, uh, I think he's a bit of a crackpot. <laughs> well, I was going to say because you know you you go round and round in circles, Neil, online. I mean, it, every name. I, I don't envy the board this this task because whoever you come up with. Someone always chips in with, oh, I'm not him, he's this, he's that, he was no good here, he's no good there. Um, and round and round the side, I don't, I don't know that there is a perfect managerial candidate to, to, to find. And whoever you appoint, you're going to be, um, someone's going to take a pot shot at you for, for making that appointment. I, I remember when Gary Rowick came in back in 2019, you know, people weren't happy with that. He's, and to some extent, you can talk about the football, but he, he's been a successful manager from the Mill perspective. Maybe not as successful as we could have, should have been, but he's certainly done a pretty good job and did a pretty good job for us. Um, so whoever you select here, I mean, I'm just looking at the, let's take the sky bet odds as, as, a, as a baseline. Nathan Jones' favourite. Um, then Joe Edwards, who's come in from nowhere. Then Michael Beale and Kevin Muscat, um, who seems to be less and less spoken of at the moment, Muscat, Beale less and less mention of him online. It does seem to come down to this choice between Nathan Jones and Joe Edwards. The thing with Nathan Jones that strikes me is when you look at his um, CV on his Wikipedia page, probably a better way to put it, um, he had a couple of flops, didn't he? He was manager at uh, Southampton and Stoke City, two flops, but he did pretty well over a few years with, with Luton Town. The personality issue is 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 the is the thing, and I suppose my only 
um, doubt is the last time we had a personality manager, inverted commas, was uh, certainly in Holloway. And, you know, he, he also cracked under, or cra- has a track record of cracking under pressure. Now, that's the only thing that maybe, um, you know, bothers me about Nathan Jones. But otherwise, playing-wise and achievement-wise, he's a pretty good candidate for Millwall FC, I think. Um, you can't argue what he's done with Luton over two spells. Mate, it's a very attractive job. We've said it. We've said it as soon as uh, as soon as we did that show with H and yeah. I think Michael and uh, Aaron when uh, on the evening that row it went. Uh, it's a very very attractive job at Millwall. You're not kicked out the door after a few bad results. No, uh, you're not. No, you're given time to grow. You're given time to. I think it's also worth saying, Neil. I mean, that the fans have this reputation of being, um, you know, hard to to please and so on. But I mean, the amount of time and um, what should we call it, um, space and forgiveness, or whatever way you want to put it, given to say Gary Rowett, for example, and and even with Ian Holloway when he was in his pomp, I mean, he got he did not start getting the catching the heat until very late in his tenure. And I'd say that about. Holloway and and Gary Rowett really. It's only when it started to, unless it was me, I didn't want all the words from the start. And <laughs> Apart from you, but I mean, I'm talking stadium wise. You know, you, you, yeah, yeah. No. When the stadium turns, it's, there was there was a couple of incidents with Gary Rowett, but he turned around. It wasn't that common. Um, you know, it's only become it becomes the fashion amongst the kids to start saying Gary Rowett, your football was shit. Um, because everyone else is doing it, so there's a joining in quality. But that was only quite recent, really, on on any kind of regular basis. My my point being that for um, a fan base with a reputation for not tolerating um, certain certain things, you know, we, we we give a lot of space and time to our managers. Actually, I believe. Yeah, it, yeah. We look at Nathan Jones. I think I've fun enough. I was listening to Simon Jordan on Talk Sport yesterday, and he thinks that Nathan Jones is our level. Mm. That, that we are as far as Nathan Jones can go, which I'm not against. Uh, I've, the thing that the nagging thing of doubt in the back of my mind is the way that he left Luton for the second time to go to Southampton. Ambition, though, Neil, isn't it? Um, I mean, you could throw that into Michael Beale. Um, and, and and I don't know the this Joe Joe Edwards, but is is that 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 um, that ambition? I'm, I don't know, I can't think of a better word. Um, that will that will come into any manager. I would have thought. I think I, I can't imagine there's a manager that if they get given a chance to go to in Beale's case, Glasgow Rangers. Um, yeah, but uh, Beale said four days before he wasn't interested. Yeah, <laughs> this is football. <laughs> this is football. <laughs> Quite honest, yeah. And I think he actually tried to run before he could walk. Somebody very badly advised him. Yes, yes, yes. Yeah. I mean, Gary Rowett fell foul of that, Neil, didn't he? To a certain extent, I can see why Nathan Jones would do it. But, okay, yeah, but he's made, what, £6 million, £7 million in, in what... <laughs> Three or four months, however long he was there, so he can now afford to be fussy. Yeah, yeah. If he wants a way back into the job, I know that they keep on playing his press conferences from from the end of his time with uh, Southampton. Yeah, and using it as kind of a stick to beat him. But I wouldn't be against the appointment. Uh, I wouldn't want him on a long contract. I think. Uh, a rolling contract with some kind of break clause. I'm I'm not convinced, but I'm more convinced by him than having Michael Beale or even Muscat to a certain extent. Muscat's done well in Japan, Mm. but didn't do well in Belgium. No. And and there's, he's close to Postacoglu at, uh, at Tottenham, so but these are all hazy, hazy things. I mean, the the, the Kevin Musket, um, and you know, I was at Watford. I was talking to some of the chaps around me at Watford, and of course, Musket is what you might call the people's choice. 
but that's very much because he used to go flying into tackles at, at, at a hip level and you yeah. know and that's rose tinted glasses yeah they'll be the same people that would be happy if Neil Harris was managing us in the football conference. Well, this is it. And there was, there was a, um, I'm paraphrasing here, listeners, but the, you know, basically the, 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 the feeling that I was picking up from the boys around me was that put a bit of, um, a bit of arse back into the club, you know, to get the ground pair of bollocks and this kind of thing. And that that's fine. Um, but I mean, Neil Harris did the same thing when he was with us, Neil. And you know, that, that runs out of steam at a certain point. A good football side will, in the end, be a willing workhorse parabolic side, in the end, because that's what we found out with Neil Harris. In the end, we were getting outplayed. And Football's some... evolved, doesn't it? Yeah, but well, let's be honest. You can't just have bollocks anymore. <laughs> of course like, not. <laughs> you have to have a certain amount of skill and panache, I guess, if you like. You have to play football the right way now. You can't really get away with... <laughs> Yeah, with the old school Route One, can no, you? No, 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 Musket was a good player. I mean, you know, I'm going to leave aside the physicality and, and the disciplinary side of his game, but he was a good player. And no, he, he, was. He, he probably should have been a better player, but for the disciplinary and you know uh, all the reputational side of of his game. So who knows? You know, with, with him, a I... brilliant manager, but I'm not sure if he's the right manager for Millwall now. To be honest, he's never had a job in this country. No. He didn't get the Rangers job. But, and, no, uh, no. Apparently the Japanese want him to stay. So, and it just seems to me that if he hadn't been a former Millwall player, people would probably say, oh, oh yeah, no, fuck that mascot. He's, he's, just, he's got, he's got, there is the rose-tinted yeah. memory of, of years yeah, ago. Yeah, there are. Um, and, and there's this nostalgia amongst Millwall fans that you have to have some kind of connection with the club. If you've got some kind of connection with the club, yeah, almost untouchable. You, you look at uh, you have Danny Mack and uh, Billy Mitchell, yeah, both actually Millwall fans, yeah. yeah they, they, they get far less criticism than if they weren't Millwall fans, which is which is fair enough. Yeah, which is fair enough, but it just, I think we've got to move on. Jones is a good candidate. I didn't know actually anything about this guy, Joe Edwards, until... No, I didn't. I've read about him since yesterday. He, 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 he seems like a very good candidate. I'm going to run a, a clip shortly of him speaking to Everton. He was assistant manager uh, to, or a coach at... Uh, at Everton with um, with Frank Lampard. Now some people will laugh as soon as you say Frank Lampard, but he's 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 coached at a high level. England under twenties, I think. I've got. Achtung, Milbein. A young coach when when I'm in and around people that you know can talk about the game and, and draw on vast experience, but at the same time, you know, I've been coaching in terms of planning training sessions and analysing for games and preparing game plans, that, that's something I've been doing a long time. So I don't feel sort of inexperienced in that sense. Um, at the same time, something I would say about my age as well is sometimes I do find it particularly easy to relate to the players on some levels, which is really important. Um, you know, in, in my previous role at Chelsea, I came through into the first team set up at a time where there were a number of young players breaking through that you know, I'd, we'd almost grown up together. They'd grown up as kids in the academy and I'd progressed th as a coach and been with them in my mid-20s to early 30s um, and we'd shared that together. So sometimes I think the, my age does help in that sense to sort of connect with players, which is a big part of coaching. Um, but certainly I, I know I've got a lot of experience and a lot of experience at a fantastic level uh, working at Chelsea. But at the same time, whenever I come across players or coaches at this level, you can always learn and, and gain experience from everyone. I think it starts from the work you do day to day. I mean, you know, obviously you talk about mine and Frank's background, him as a player. It, when you talk about success, you're referring to a lot of trophies and uh, the level that I'd worked at, it's, it's all relative. At the level I'd worked at in the academy, there would be a lot of success that people would, you know, they would summarise the success based on Youth Cup trophies and stuff like that. It, we're, we're, not, we're not expecting to walk into a club and all of a sudden start winning silverware instantly. But at the same time, 
the, the standards that you set for all of the staff around the building, all of the players on a daily basis, to sort of to think like that, to think like the, the, the way that winners do every day and, and push yourself. That's the only way you've got any chance of, of getting anywhere near those levels over a long period. And we just hope the players to, to keep putting the work rate in, to keep buying into the ideas of how we press together. And then the, when we have the ball, it's, you know, we, we want to find that balance. Um, we, you know, we were watching the team earlier on in the season and looking at stats as well, and we felt probably with the players that are here, you know, it would probably be a, a positive thing to have more possession and control games by having the ball more. And I think if you look at the, the fourth goal against Brentford, which was Andros's goal, I think that came at the end of like a 30-pass passage, which when I watched that back, I saw the players enjoying playing, enjoying getting on the ball. We were in total control of the game. So that's a big feature of how we want to play. Achtung, Milbal. Here is the current England under-20s manager. Yeah. He was released as a 16-year-old by Chelsea. Yeah. Played some games for AFC Wimbledon. Yeah. I did at 20 that he didn't want to play anymore and would concentrate on coaching. Yeah. I was offered a job at Chelsea coaching their under eights, I believe. With Ta- he, I think he bought through Tammy Abraham and uh, one or two others. And has made his way through the ranks. has has been under a lot of very very good managers. Absolutely, absolutely. And got promoted to Thomas Tuchel's uh, uh, first team staff, didn't he? And then left to go to Everton with Lampard. It's worked in the England setup, uh, and this is from a post from Jim Lucas, who. Uh, Shout out to Jim. Um, he said he's been in, in amongst the England setup on and off since 2017. He was assistant coach when the under 18 national side won the Toulon tournament of that year. So, um, as you say, he's 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 been involved with top level players and top level coaches and managers. Um, it's an interesting choice. I'm under, I mean, you know, I know nothing of him apart from a YouTube interview, which, as I say, I'll, I'll play. But um, you know, it's 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 interesting that he's come out of nowhere. Really, um, the other, the thing that struck me is that we, it can, we we've said this question a few times, Neil, and uh, you know, I mean, Jones will bring a kind of um, a successful Luton quality, if you want to put it that way. So that's going to be um, one one approach that we can be as a Millwall FC. The other side of it is, what kind of Mill do we want to be if we want to aim any higher than that? And Edwards would be a risk, that's for sure. But it, he, he's if you're going to take a risk, then take a risk on somebody that's, that's been in and around high-level players and high-level management. So he's a very interesting choice. Um, he comes over quite um, very articulate and he knows what he's talking about. I'm just looking at some of the comments from this Everton interview, uh, listeners, but he's, it's one chap here says this fella clearly knows his stuff um, and he's part of a coaching team that fills him with confidence. Now, you know, obviously in the end, you only judge by your results, but he does give a good impression. So he's an interesting name out of nowhere, really. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm wondering if Steve Kavanagh and Aldo are thinking of going down the kind of Kieran McKenna route at Ipswich. He was an unknown. Yeah, They've appointed him and he's got them into the championship, doing very well in the championship. Yeah. Maybe this is the I wouldn't be against it. I, I think I think that if these two are the last two, yeah. or the final two, yeah. it's a brilliant problem to have. And obviously he's interviewed with us. Yeah. So he must quite fancy the job. And that must probably say an awful lot about Millwall. It's, a, it's an ambitious, it would be an ambitious choice in a way that maybe Nathan Jones wouldn't be as ambitious. And I might be doing him a disservice. I don't know him. I've only got the you know. Jones is a more established choice of the two. Yeah. Uh, 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 Joe Edwards, it seems as if, would be a kind of left field choice. Young, but, a young coach as well, Neil, which we exactly. haven't had. A, Young, yeah, young coach. I mean, I'm trying to think when we last had a young coach. I'm going back to another, it wasn't exactly unknown, but he, uh, uh, as a manager he was, it was George Graham, who was probably a similar well, kind of, you know, when yeah, he joined us. Would have been Dennis Wise. Yeah, player manager. Yeah, that's true. Yeah, yeah. 
Um, think, or even Harris to a certain extent, because Harris would only have. We wouldn't have been long out of his playing boots, would he? So um, Harris wouldn't have been before his fortieth birthday. I don't think. So it's an interesting choice. I mean, as I've said, I know nothing. There's not even a Wikipedia page on Joe Edwards, so um, he's clearly under the radar. Um, second favourite, three to one, according to Skybet, with Nathan Jones at, at uh, favourites, five to four. Um, but yeah, I mean, it would be an ambitious move, and. It'd be a very interesting move. How long? How long? Um, you know, he'd get because whoever comes in there, I think that's probably the only thing that might make Mill think twice with the experience of Nathan Jones. You're going to have to come in, hit the ground running with a squad that's um, that's got, it's got its flaws. It's got its good side. It's got its flaws at the moment. We saw some of those flaws at, at Watford last Saturday. You know, can get in front. It's a team that can get in front, but can't retain a lead. And I think whoever comes in needs to get to grips with that fairly sharpish because we're we're letting points get away from us at the moment. Yeah, I think that if we were to appoint Joe Edwards, he'd be one of these new age coaches, I guess, would bring in new age ideas. Youngsters from the various connections he's got, I guess. Yeah. Working with our talent as well, you know, that that can be a good thing. He would actually, obviously, know Romain Eze quite well. Yeah. From the England under-18 setup, I think he's managed him there, hasn't he? Uh, Um, He probably would have done, yes. That's right. I'm just wondering if, could it boil down to Nathan Jones wanting to bring his own people in? Well, you would yep. expect whoever comes in to... I mean, whether whether Joe Edwards has his own people or... I mean, Nathan Jones would do. Well, he built his own people, yeah. He wouldn't have his, no. his core team, would he? Whereas Nathan Jones has probably taken... Yeah, as Gary Rowett did to a certain extent. Rowett took Callum Davidson with him, didn't he? Yeah. Oh. I mean, I, I, listening to the interview... This was an evident interview, listeners, so, you know... Take take that with a pinch of salt if you want. But um, Edwards comes over as a very very level headed guy. Now he whether he has his own people in that sense. I mean Gary Rowett clearly has a an entourage of people that he takes with him. That that health and fitness director left us recently. I would imagine because of Gary Rowett departing. Um, I suppose it takes you to the the Adam Parrott <laughs> question. Well, <laughs> don't you with him, please. Yeah. <laughs> but there, there it is. There it is. I mean, I can't imagine that Nathan Jones would come in and not have his own assistant coming in, which means that you know it's it's bye bye Adam basically. Um, I'd imagine, unless they're going to you know move him downwards, he might not want to do that. He might see himself as being um, a level now. So anyway, you'd, you'd imagine Nathan Jones would want to bring his own guys in with him. Um, question with uh, Joe Edwards would be whether he would want to do similar. Now, I, my, the only thing that is occurring to me as I'm speaking really is he comes over and somebody that's been around the track with some high level players. He might well have people in mind that he would want to work with, and that again might mean bye bye Adam. Um, yeah, he might want to bring Frank Lampard in. As he... <laughs> he might do. He might. Do. <laughs> yeah, for God's sake, do not take that remark seriously. <laughs> well, who knows? If he, 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 my, my point being, he seems like the kind of guy that is not a mug, and he would probably have an idea what he wants to do. Um, so it's going to be a tough choice. I don't envy the Millwall board making that choice. Um, I suppose if I if you were to ask me. What do I think they will do, Neil? And I suppose I'd think they'd probably err on the side of Nathan Jones purely because he's he's a proven championship level manager at a club at the same a very similar standing to ourselves, and that that must count for something. Uh, Edwards would be an ambitious choice with risk built into it. Interesting one, though. Yeah, very very interesting. Yeah, well, it could be that Edwards has totally blown them away in the interview. <laughs> it's impressive. Uh, yeah. Um, yeah well, and if they were testing the waters with Nathan Jones the other day, because it leaked out, didn't it, on mm. Tuesday night? And uh, I, I had a couple of WhatsApps yesterday. I had a WhatsApp conversation with a couple of people. Yeah. And we were wondering if that had been leaked out so the club could test the water, so to speak. And then Joe Edwards has come out yesterday morning. It would have been written yesterday morning. No two ways about it because it came out from Sammy Morkel on the mail online. Yeah. yeah. So that would have been written 
immediately, so it would have been a fresh story. And the club haven't shot it down. I don't no. think Cowley's shot it down, as in he's generally... He's generally on the money, Rich, isn't well, he? He's near to the... Um... The press office in... Uh, and that, uh, so it's not been shot down. I generally think it's it's a horrible decision to have to make between these two, <laughs> but it's a fascinating decision. But I think it's one we've got to reach immediately. We can't mess around anymore. No, I agree with you there. I agree with you. It's sooner rather than later. Um, you have a look at the table, and it starting to look a bit worrying that we could get dragged in. I think what are we well, all it will take is QPR to live in their act up or Sheffield Wednesday or I think Rotherham or the other team to start getting that's a couple it. of wins in and then suddenly we're drawn into that Neil. So um Yeah but that's the key game is Sheffield Wednesday on Saturday week. Yeah. Really? Yeah we have to go I think it's away isn't it? I think it's up there. Uh, that's at Hillsborough yeah that's right next Saturday. In our um, classic case at the minute the you know the owners appealing to the real owners of the club the fans to put in 2 million money, basically yeah. Yeah he obviously doesn't know his fucking market up there because I think they've got bloody 2 million bang. It says yeah. that if, if if 200 people put I can't remember how much money was in there they would clip wipe out their HRM uh, you know it was, it was cut a few hundred quid each I mean you're not going to get that. Yeah, was, yeah wasn't it 200 people putting in under a pound, a thousand pound? Or so, I don't know what it was. He was after it was a it was an appeal for money, basically. It was no more than what you know the people that walk up and down the tube trains asking <laughs> for money. It was that that kind of level, really. You know, there's a fascinating. Just going back to Nathan Jones for a second, if I may, Neil. Well, there's there's a great um, post, a long long post. I won't read it all, listeners. Um, by a chap called Fox Punter, Mike Holden. He's got blue tick, but I don't know if that means anything. Um, whether he's a valid. Yeah. Yeah, no, that just means that he just paid for it. He's paid for it. <laughs> anyway, someone asked if it was his, Nathan Jones's dad that wrote this. But anyway, um, he said uh, this is his, his piece. It was a long piece, and I won't read it. Um, very good piece, to be honest. It was yeah. No, this is why I thought I'd mention it, because it, 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 a couple of quotes. Nathan Jones to Millwall was a mouth-watering prospect, says this guy, Fox Punter. Uh, one of the EFL's most tribal clubs. Most tribal? The tribal club, I would say. Paired with one of its most tribal managers, don't read too much into his failed attempts to build connections at Stoke or Southampton. This is a bit that um, struck me. He's an intense character, full on, straight out of the gate, no holding back. He knows no other way. He's confrontational, Neil, and he takes people out of their comfort zones. He doesn't request buy-in. He demands it. Um, basically, he's... I think any that's the case for any manager, though, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. yeah. I mean, people, people are getting quite excited reading this. I mean, one bloke said he's got a semi on Raven Reddit, is it? <laughs> which made me laugh. <laughs> um, he's a committed character. Um, the focus is on, um, on, on you know, uh, being a winner, basically. I don't know, I'm trying to paraphrase it. No one whips up a crowd like Nathan. I like, like the Mill crowd needs someone to whip them up. That could, um, that could end in tears, couldn't it? Okay. P for hell, doesn't it? Yeah. He puts them in, <laughs> in the same sentence. Nathan Jones, he's got uh, Jurgen Klopp, Daniel Farker, Diego Simeone. It's an effortless flow state that runs through that personality type. This was the bit that struck me, and I saw it on his Wikipedia thing. He's a deeply religious man with a blinding faith that permeates his attitude towards everything. And when you read his um, wiki page, um, he's got Michelangelo's um, David. Uh, Michelangelo's uh, Last Supper, and that was it, a tattooed across his back. Uh, the creation of Adam, excuse me. On his, uh, He's got various religious um, tattoos. Now, that doesn't hold him back, but I must admit, <laughs> you think, okay. <laughs> yeah, but, come, come down Millwall, Neil. <laughs> yeah, but can he take me in for the cunt by the... Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, by the West and lower, because it, his face will be tested. <laughs> yeah, but I think it's probably yeah, but I think it's probably a very good job that Steve Kavanagh has opened up a multi faith ring <laughs> because because I think because I think it might be seeing quite frequent business. <laughs> There's several religious tattoos. I'm not religious, listeners. I'm an active atheist, so you know, take me with a pinch of salt if you like. See, well, I wouldn't hold his religion against him if no, he. No, no, I wouldn't. I'm, I'm taking a. Mickey, really, but um, yeah. 
anyone that has the creation of Adam across your back. You've got to sit there for a long while having a needle pricked into you, which might be good prep for the slower when we don't get a result when we think they think we shouldn't. <laughs> there we are. <laughs> um, yeah, on to Saturday. We've got a tough game Saturday, Neil Southampton. Um, you know, I, I imagine it's going to be Adam Barrett taking that game on. Um, I thought we weren't bad at Watford. It was an entertaining game. We need to be a bit better against Southampton because they're, they're a different prospect, I think, to, to Watford. So they're fourth in the table. Um some way behind the top two now that's turning into a, a two horse race the, the division Leicester and Ipswich at the top then the the next four which will be where the action is um, but Southampton certainly in the in the playoff zone at the moment so we could do with a win we could do with a home win badly we could do with a home win and we need a home win uh, full but... house full house apparently uh, nearly a full house Saturday unfortunately they're a bogey side mm. do you know the last time we beat well, I can remember. I was trying to think of games where we've beaten them. And this off the top of my head, I'm I'm going way back to Division One days. I mean, you know, no. further no. back, seventies. Yep, I can remember going to watch Mill beat. I mean, going like a long way back in the mid seventies. Um, they had Peter yep. Osgood playing for them. Neil, they had Peter Osgood playing for for Southampton back then. They did. Mike Shannon, yep. I think. Um, I think we beat three 0 If memory serves, is that correct? We did. I thought that. I was at that game. That is very, very good knowledge. It was the seventeenth of September. Well, I didn't know that was the last time that we beat them. I remember if it's only having got through the, the, the you know, if it's going oh. back and back and back. But that was, that was a standout game. It was a good game. That was Gordon Jago era of football, which um, it was. Uh, it was. Uh, well, we beat them three 0 Yeah, as you said, nine thousand nine hundred and fifty-two. That second oh. one with me. <laughs> the side was actually Nicky Johns, Dave Donaldson, Phil oh. Walker, Terry Brisley. He he was good substituted player. by uh, Trevor Lee. Another good player. Tony Hazel, Brian yeah. Hamilton, John yeah. Seaton, Lindsay Smith. Walker. Yeah, because he played he played for us in the seventies. Striker. Yeah. When he came back, he was a centre half, didn't he? he, played yeah, in he was. yeah. Uh Ian Pearson, who was a part timer, who who was a teacher, uh, and Brian he was still a scorer, wasn't he? Was he not? Was he not? Uh, he was. A, he was a good striker. I think he was actually leading scorer that season. Yeah. Pearson on eighteen minutes, John Seisman twenty three, and Brian Hamilton on forty three. The reason I looked at it was I couldn't remember the last time we'd actually beaten Southampton at home. And it took me five or ten minutes. And do you know the time we beat them before that? Hmm. Well, the Southampton used to be a first division side when I first started going to football. So I'm going to guess it would be some years before then. I, um, wow. Well, I don't know. It was 1974. Uh, the 12th okay. October 1974. Uh, and there was a synergy between now and then. Do you know what it was? 74. I would have been going at that point. Um, I can't remember that game off the top of my head. Um, would it have been after the end of Benny Fenton that Fenton had left us at that point? Very, very good piece wow. of knowledge, Mr. Hart. We wow. Actually- I'm doing the uh, the Usain Bolt sign for any... This is a sound podcast, so it's lost on all you listeners. But anyway... <laughs> Yeah, that would have been the end of Benny. That was a big. The old Foley as a caretaker manager. That was before the arrival of Gordon Jago, who then would go on to take us to that very entertaining season, the 75 76. And you can mention anything you like about that, Neil, if you want. 75 76 season. I just happen to have written a book on the 75 76. Have you? How about that? Very nice into that, which is available. On Amazon, and uh, I will be tweeting it out. I'll serve uh, them up. You knock them in the net, mate. <laughs> definitely. You, uh, yeah, but I'll knock them in the net. Brian Clark style, who scored two goals that yeah, night. Good player. Along with Gordon Bolland, who scored two. Uh, another 9,000 crowd, so we're going to yeah. double that this weekend. And the team, for those that are interested, Brian yeah. Kent, yeah. good bloke. Brian Brown, who died earlier this year. 
Eddie Jones shares Eddie Jones. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Australian rugby uh, rugby union coach, an England <laughs> rugby union coach, obviously. <laughs> Dave Donaldson, yeah. Alan Dorney, Frank Saul, good players. Uh, Gordon Bolland, Big Alfie Wood. Alfie Wood. Yeah, he passed away, didn't he? he was, uh, a yeah, good about yeah, yeah. Uh, Brian Clark, wonderful yeah. guy. Spoke yeah. to him a number of times. And Doug Alder. Great team. That was a team. I mean, I, I started going, <clears throat> excuse me, I started going in 72. So, really, my first full season was 72 3. But seven, the 73 4 season, I was getting older. You start to appreciate what's going on around you rather than being a kid, you know, just a, a, in awe of going to football. Um, but that was my one of my first sides where I could probably still name off the top of my head, um, you know, without without checking. Great players, um, Benny Fenton, great manager. When he when he left the Den, it was it was a big thing because he'd been there for about eight or nine years, I think, and had taken us very very close to the top flight. And it was quite sad when he when he left. Um, but the arrival of Jago was felt to be interesting synergy, as we're talking about now. Was was felt to be um, a move in the right direction. Was, Jago was going to take us up a level. I mean, obviously, in the end, it wouldn't um, work out that way. But um, he came in from QPR with their reputation for playing bright seventies attractive football. Um, and lo and behold, he did. It was, these those were good seasons to follow Millwall as a kid. Um, you know, yeah, he was, didn't he? he? Yeah, we got them promoted. 75, 76, which is my first ever taste of success at Millwall. You don't get much of a taste of success at the Den listeners, do you? But that was the first time I was aware I was that I was going and we achieved success. Wonderful season. We could talk about that on another show, Neil, time of your book, mate, because I can talk about that for, you know, uh, for England. Um, a wonderful season. I, I, um, I, From looking at those seasons for the book, it, quite an interesting time. We were skint. Mm. But low, low crowds, at some you know, yeah, some four, four, awful five. crowds. Yeah. Uh, constantly trying to find the money, uh, trying to find money for signings, and lo and behold, we went shopping in the Isthmian League. Yeah, and came up with two absolute gems in yeah, Phil- Trevor Lee and Phil Walker. I mean, you don't do that anymore, do you? <laughs> More's a pity. More's a pity. Yeah, so, so, so there's an awful lot of parallels. I know we're not. Skin, no, no, but we haven't no, got on that level, level. But no, there are parallels, certainly comparatively speaking. Um, I think what what the, the memory I have because that was the first time where football kind of lifted me up, if you want. Um, following Millwall, anyway. Obviously, you're aware of other clubs having success on TV and, and cup runs, but that was the first time I I was in a stadium where promotion was achieved, and there was this building sense or season. Of initial, um, it was initially quite wasn't flat, but we weren't doing very well about mid table in the third division, and then gradually there was a surge from Christmas onwards. Some huge games against Crystal Palace, massive crowds. I mean, I remember going to Palace nil nil. I think it was towards the end of the season that year, and it was about, I think about thirty eight thousand in in Selhurst Park. Massive, and you know, big big situations. The Den, we we beat Brighton famously three one. Trevor Lee scoring an overhead scissor kick that probably is a lot better in my memory. Uh, that it may have been in re- reality, but that's that's what football does to you. Um, Twenty three thousand in in, in Coldblow Lane, and it was just a wonderful season. So it was the first time I'd been involved or for part of um, success, and you need that. You need something for kids to latch on to. I think that's one of the, one of the criticisms Neil I'd make of the last few years with Gary Rowe. It's it's been moderately successful by Mill standards, but it hasn't been entertaining. And for youngsters, they need they need heroes and they need they need fizz. They need not not fizz, our fizz, but you know what I mean, like football kind of pizzazz. And um, attention spans. They need instant success. It's like influence. You need something to latch on to. And I, you know, I can still remember incidents and moments from that season. Aged, what would have been then, 15, yeah, 16 nearly. And that's what you need. That's what keeps you coming back for the rest of your life. Um, but, yeah, so a wonderful season. Anyway, we've, we've waxed lyrical about um, about that season. But, yeah, I, th- I didn't realise that was how far back you have to go for a, a win over Southampton. That's incredible, isn't it? Um, yeah, well, I couldn't remember one. And I thought, I, I, don't yeah. remember, I don't think I've ever seen us beat Southampton at home. And we've well, not played them an awful lot. 
they've generally been at a higher level than us. So a bit like, um, yeah. you know, they, 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 they were, um, in my, in my youth, they were a first division side. I think they would, they would obviously get relegated and pop back up again. It's probably too big for division two or the championship. And always, um, historically playing at the Dell, which was a wonderful old ground, um, very oddly shaped ground with one end that's on a on a kind of a sloping road. So you had this kind of odd a kind of yeah, but that kind uh, of three tiered terrace down there. And it was odd, wasn't it? Um, if you ever watch it on the big match, it's probably you go on about grounds of character. <laughs> that end had to be one of the most character absolutely absolutely ends ever. Absolutely. I remember going down there. It would have been about this era, seventy six, maybe seventy seven. We won three two at, at the Dell. Um, and a bit of a come, a, a slightly a, a sense of winning against the odds because I think Southampton were looking up and we were fighting relegation. That was a season or two later from these games we're talking about. But um, yeah, no, very, very, a very old fashioned ground in that sense with a real quirk. You don't get that in. in Did you go down there when we played Salisbury in the FA Cup, Nick? Uh, that would be in the early 80s, wouldn't it? Salisbury was out of the Dell. Um, yeah, I think it was. I, I don't think I went to that one. I, I remember going, I went to uh, Fratton Park, their great rivals, Fratton Park, for the, the home game that was, um, we were banned from the den. That would follow the quarterfinal um, riot <laughs> in, the, in the late 70s against Ipswich. And we got banned, so we had to play a home game at Portsmouth. I don't think I went to the Salisbury game, Neil. Um, I can't remember if I did. Um, which was I told them? No, I don't think I did. I remember going to the, the Southampton 3-2 win. That was in the mid-70s. I don't think I made that one for some reason. Girlfriends, probably. I probably had to go and take a girlfriend out or something. Not the Millwall I know. <laughs> <laughs> we've all been there, mate. We've all been there. <laughs> yeah, no, well, we've all had the ultimatum. It's hard. <laughs> Where you go, Southampton, and watch Mill play Salisbury in the first round of the FA Cup. <laughs> yeah, but it's either Mill or me, and it's, oh, I'll, yeah, but I'll see you later. I'm going to get the track. <laughs> it's not, not the best chat up line in the world, is it? But there we are. <laughs> oh, dear. Anyway, um, Southampton at home Saturday. It's, it's our remembrance day. Um, if you want to buy a poppy, listeners, come and find me. I, I, I'm hoping it won't be pouring down with rain because I'm going to be giving Mel um, Bird off of Hoff um, uh, some assistance selling poppies. I don't know where she's going to post me. I'm entirely at her disposal, Neil. Um, so, but if you do see me, I will be standing with my tray of poppies and various kinds. Now you can get the, the traditional paper ones and the little badge ones, which I quite like. Or you can order ones, I think, from the Royal British Legion, which has got the Mill badge and the poppy entwined. I'm hoping that I'll be able to... Um, get some of the well i don't know if they'll have any of those but it'd be a great idea if they did because they would really shift um but yeah so i'll be i'll be standing there with uh, my poppy tray um so give dig deep dig deep we always do well on the on the remembrance ceremonies Neil, and then uh you know hoping we'll get some good money together yeah well i'm half hoping that you have h next to you and you can charge a premium for people <laughs> Uh, who lash some abuse at him. Yeah, well, that would certainly make a few quid for the world. Oh, I think he gets his... I think people like to like like it when Nate is on the show. He's, he's always always entertainment and um, got a lot of time for Harry. Um, yeah, no, we don't, I don't really get any abuse. No one's ever abused me, actually. I, I, I'm saying hello to a few people at Watford. I, what you don't... You don't get abuse. What you get is very suspicious looks because there's who's the nutcase speaking into his iPhone that's standing at the end of the row there you know it's a very um eccentric thing to do and I accept that eccentricity and it's the price I pay to bring listeners I hope a show they want to listen to but it, you do get some um odd odd views now I'm, I've got to be honest with you people often think I'm from security or the police or some I don't know what you know the deep state or something <laughs> reporting what I see around me <laughs> what, you actually, what you actually need is you need a posse. I think that Dan off Lions TV has a little posse around. It? Yeah, I, I, I don't want a posse. <laughs> <laughs> you need a crew to be able yeah, just to be bang with the kids. And they can go out on a minute. Yeah, no, well, that's not part of the pod father. <laughs> I don't want a crew. I quite enjoy going to football as it is. I don't want no crew around me. <laughs> <laughs> oh dear! No, you do. You do. Once you start talking to people, and and once you get past the um, the uh, the the initial kind of uh, what's the podcast part? What is that? 
Um, <clears throat> generally, people most most people are all right. Some are even willing to talk to you. So, um, but one thing I would say is how the sight of a microphone will make the hardest hardcore Millwall fan run a mile. Um, <laughs> the police don't need a, a, a bat on charge. You just need to get some microphones out and ask them some questions about about the football, and that'll make people run. Mate, it is scary. It's very yeah, scary. I, I remember the first time I did local radio, yeah. a Crawley Town match, when I was on the Crawley Observer many, many, many years ago. And it was probably the most terrifying experience of my it is life. Terrifying. Yeah, I mean, that's live. I mean, when we did the live radio uh, with, with Aaron, Love Sport. <clears throat> I had no experience of live radio, um, but same thing. You you you're kind of um, fighting this kind of uh, inner inner fear. You're going to say something really stupid, or uh, Coleman balls, where you say you know like a really stupid sentence, or or you swear or something, and they have to press the the dump button on you. You know, so there there is a fear factor. Um, there was. Yeah. Let's start I start doing this. I mean, we record these, Neil, so you can you can edit it, and, and I do edit it to make myself sound um, intelligent sometimes. Because sometimes you come out with some stuff, and you think, what the, what the fuck am I on about there? Why do I say that? But you have to cut that out, and then no one knows you said it. You see. But when I started doing this, I was very nervous. I must say, I can remember, and there's probably a YouTube clip of this uh, oh. somewhere. There was a there was a program called Sports Tonight Live. And for some unknown reason, they had me as a studio guest a number of times. <laughs> I want to see that. I'm going to have to find this YouTube clip. <laughs> uh, I don't think it's of the live TV, but it was three hours of live television. Blimey, that's a long while. It it was. And I remember the first time that I went in to do it, mm. uh, me being me, you know, a bit of a geezer and all of this lot. <laughs> Yeah, but a bit of a geezer with Tourette's. <laughs> <laughs> I was just trying not to swear for three hours. It's hard work. It's hard work, you know. Is. And the only thing going through your mind is, I, I, the guy I was doing it with is a former Southampton player called Gordon Watson. I remember that name, yeah. And uh, he was asking the questions, and I wasn't thinking about the answers. The only thought going through my mind was, don't say fuck or cunt. <laughs> Do not say fuck or cunt. Yeah. <laughs> Do not say those words. And to make it worse, they shared a studio with Babe Station. Oh, right. Okay. <laughs> so, at so at about quarter to ten, you had these naked women coming in, preparing. <laughs> go on their set yeah. you know, looking over because you had a TV screen in front of you <laughs> or where you were commenting on stuff on <laughs> and all of a sudden this naked woman would appear with a bloody bag full of sex toys and things Di diverting when you're trying to talk about football yeah. <laughs> or rugby or whatever oh yeah. mate don't honestly and you, <laughs> uh, but no yeah, but that's taken us off on a complete tangent. Yeah, I think we've probably reached the end of the conversation. But interesting stuff. I, and I'm going to find this YouTube clip now and, um, you know, publicise that if I can find it. But there we are. Um, let's finish. We've got, a, we've got a pundit question to finish us off here. Now, I asked at the start of today's show, listeners, one of West Germany, Germany's best ever players, a forward played in the same four World Cups as Pelé. A photo of him leaving the field after losing the 66 Cup final to World Cup final to England was voted Photo of the Century by Kicker Magazine, 476 appearances for Hamburg, 72, uh, 404 goals for them, 72 appearances for the West German national side, 43 goals. Name of that player. It's not Gerd Müller, as you thought. I would have probably hey, gone something or other. Is Uwe Seyler. Uwe Seyler. Oh, Uwe Seyler. Uwe yep. Seyler. There we are. That's a World Cup question from... Punditgames.co.uk. Buy your ball games for Christmas. It's a great football game, listeners. And every sale, if you select the Acton Mill drop down, goes the benefit goes to the Lions Food Hub. Um, there we are. So I shall see you all Saturday. Come buy a poppy from me. Until the next show, from Neil and myself, it's goodbye from me. And it's goodbye from me. Till the next show. Arrivederci, Millwall.